hi everyone um am audible yes ankit we can hear you yes great so my name is ankit gupta i am work as principal at uh, at uh, and managing the energy and climate change practice at intelicap um i have been associated with uh, energy catalyst program for the last 2 years so we started this program in march 2020 and the idea was to support entrepreneurs to scale their operations from uk to asia and africa countries if you see the energy catalyst program it has supported more than um, 70 entrepreneurs um, across this last 2 years but if you see the rounds that he has it has eight rounds already been done and the ninth round is in progress from that perspective it has supported more than 310 unique organizations in the last eight years and provided funding for more than 150 million dollars 150 million dollar pounds the idea is to support entrepreneurs to help them scale and grow and uh, and and go uh, and ex- expand their offerings in other countries and manage the energy poverty situations in countries like asia and africa where it's most needed it it has supported more than 345 projects and it has provided supported more than 300 unique organizations so the idea is to help these entrepreneurs with financial support with business support with partnerships with networks with an understanding of how these markets can behave how markets behave differently and what are the different requirements in specific markets to scale and grow from that perspective there are different sta- entrepreneurs at different stages so if you talk about a particular project particular project can have an sme can have a corporate can have an ngo and different partner organizations even universities which are coming together collaboratively to design a program and implement it in a newer geography to scale and grow from there from that perspective we have uh, multiple or- entrepreneurs at different stages and here today also we have six organizations at different stages requiring different types of capital different stages of capital and different instruments and it might be useful for us to today to hear these entrepreneurs understand where the different propositions are and what kind of capital requirements they have it helps us to understand a bit more about the different projects that energy catalyst is supporting and how it can actually solve the problem of energy poverty which is constantly being there in asia and africa and how these entrepreneurs are scaling to one of, one of these countries where they want to expand today so with that i would like to over to lc to have an introduction from these entrepreneurs and a pitch from these entrepreneurs which will help us to understand a bit more about their operations and unique offerings for the populations in asia and africa thank you thank you ankit uh thank you everyone for everyone who already joined the call i am lc wanjiko from intelicup i'm leading the sankal team in nairobi uh wh- uh just a flow of how this conversation will be every enterprise will be pitching for 5 minutes and then we'll get a 5 minute space for question and answer um we sure to invite everyone from the audience to actually ask questions to them um and you're going to be do this repeatedly for six enterprises so without further ado i just want us to go like in in the session itself so our first enterprise or the enter- entrepreneur is rokia yaman from leap micro ad uh so yes already you have the co-hosting rights so you can just go on ahead and start your pitch thank you so much rokia thank over you, to Elsie. you hi Th- thank you lc um i'm going to introduce to you leap micro ad just let me share my screen a second and um set this up So this is a company that I co-founded 2017 um and the purpose of leap is to to uh, integrate to develop integrated circular solutions to decarbonize the way we manage food waste energy and water um in such a way that creates social value and strengthens local economies um in Africa <clears throat> excuse me um indoor cooking using firewood and dung accounts for over 50% of its carbon black emissions i'll explain that in a minute but deforestation of 4 million hectares and it also negatively input, um impacts the health of many women and children um two thirds of africa's waste end up in open dump sites and landfills um this is responsible for about 11% of the carbon black emissions globally when this waste is burned and 20% of methane emissions um when the organics degrade this is a giant waste of resources um but it is also a massive opportunity sorry i'm just having trouble um 
that's it. So what I'd like to introduce is our, our, pro- our products which help to address these things. The micro AD um, is, is anaerobic digestion at the small scale, community scale. It turns organic waste into biogas and, and a liquid fertilizer. It's 10 times faster than, than the conventional um, anaerobic digestion process. Um, Nomad is, is a technology that, that takes the liquid biofertilizer, it extracts nutrients into a compact form, and it also recovers water for use. Um, the mobile CHP can use clean fuels to generate heat and electricity and using um, the latest ultra clean treatment. Um, the last two are, are circular solutions that incorporate one or more of the above products. And sorry, this keeps uh, stopping. Um, so, and what I'd like to zoom in on is actually EcoSmart, uh, which is our solution for Sub-Saharan Africa, which combines anaerobic digestion composting, solar PV and food production into a circular ecosystem that's basically zero waste. Um, this is actually a net negative carbon operation. So it's, it's, it's really tackling um, the decarbonisation issue, as well as providing a number of byproducts, um, making value out of, out of the waste by, uh, feedstock. Um, our target market for this is uh, ag- agribusinesses and cooperatives. Uh, we're focusing uh, initially on Nigeria. We're also looking to benefit rural and peri-urban communities. Um, in terms of the African ab- agribusiness growth rate, it's, it's expected to expand three times to reach three trillion by 2030. Um, and uh, in- expected installation of electricity generation is, in- is expected to increase 20 times from seven. 1,500 megawatts to 150 gigawatts. Um, and the mini grid opportunities in Nigeria is around the 9 billion mark at the moment. So in terms of business models, we, are, we can offer a straightforward CapEx model or leasing model, but within the sub-Saharan African context, we're going to be probably more closely looking at the community ownership model. So in terms of uh, just going back to the CapEx model, the CapEx model for a mini grid capacity with 100 kilowatts uh, has a payback of 3.73 years. Um, if we look at the EcoSmart community ownership model, um, it's, it's got obviously a much lower capital outlay at the beginning, but the, the community benefits from year six onwards are close to 100,000. Apologies, this is in pounds, but I, I know the pounds pretty close to the dollar at the moment, so that should be easy. Um, EcoSmart leasing model has the same capital outlay costs, but also but um, much bigger returns for LEAP uh, in the long run. But but customers benefit from um, ongoing technical support and upgrades. Okay, so where are we at the moment? We've we've done a, fees- a fifteen month feasibility study, two thousand twenty to twenty one. Um, we worked with six partners, three in the UK and six in Nigeria. In phase two, which has just literally started, uh, we, we've uh, expanded that partnership to five. So five in the UK, five in, in Nigeria. We're going to be demonstrating three sites, uh, different size systems, uh, working with um, different communities in each one to, to demonstrate the versatility of, of the, me- the model. So what, what about LEAP's wide attraction? Uh, so with all the other products uh, um, uh, taking into those account, we've identified eight potential case study sites across uh, well, world, worldwide. We've so far raised over 2 million grant funding to develop the technology to do feasibility studies in different countries. And potential customers include Bupa, uh, UK universities, local authorities, contract catering companies. Um, our resources include uh, living lab sites. We've, we've um, set up three living lab sites in London. We're about to do two more. Uh, we have fabrication facilities in, in the west of England where we make some of the larger equipment. And our team is experienced particularly in, in the engineering, design, training and project management side. We have excellent um, senior advisors who have been have long experience in the um, anaerobic digestion industry. We're expecting EcoSmart alone to generate um, around about 11 million in revenues um, over the next five years. And about 57 million in revenues over the next five years for all the project, uh, the products combined. To achieve this, we're looking for um, uh, an initial raise of 675k 
and in pounds again to launch EcoSmart, but also to to scale up some of the other products. And and this this is the breakdown. So for EcoSmart, we're looking for about 100k, and this will help to match fund the funding we've already raised. But it will basically uh, contribute to project delivery and working capital needs. Um, and the rest is to do with the other projects. Uh, we're offering around 20k, uh, sorry, 20,000. Ooh, 20% equity, um, uh, the rest being made up in grants, uh, and the close is by December 2022. Um, we see our mo business models as creating lasting, positive social and environmental impacts over the next five years, and th these basically summarise the key ones, although we, we do touch on or, or impact uh, 14 of the 17 SDGs. So, but in particular here, we've got zero hunger with 19 million tonnes uh, of food produced uh, over that five-year period, 31 million tonnes of water, uh, of waste, sorry, treated to, 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 to recover clean water, um, 229 gigawatts of low carbon electricity, 260 gigawatt hours, sorry, these are gigawatt hours of renewable heat. Um, and in terms of climate action and decarbonisation, 15.5 kilotons of CO2 saved. And I believe that's it. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, and please do get in touch if you're interested. Thank you so much, Rukia, uh, for that amazing uh, presentation. I'd like to invite the audience now to raise a hand in case you have any questions for her as well. You can also just use the chat box if you have any questions and we'll be sure to direct them to her. Also, just for everyone who's entered, uh, we are doing five minute pitches and then five minute for Q&A to six enterprises that are going to be pitching today. So Rukia has been our first enterprise. Uh, entrepreneur that is and yes we'll now invite the audience for any questions in regards to our pitch um, and her work thank you yeah um, can I ask a question well, yes right. go ahead yeah, hi, Rikia. Um, I was just interested by the 675k, 20% equity. Were you saying the equity investment you need is 20% of 675k and the rest is grants, or that in return for 675k, an equity investor gets 20% stake in your company? That's the latter is correct. Right, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Feel free to ask any question uh, to get any clarity on anything that has been said. I think there's something in the in the chat, isn't there? What's the waste collection methodology for the waste for the ADs? Okay, so we're working with um, some partners on the ground who are going to be delivering um, other elements. So we're responsible for the AD side of it and the project management bringing these partners together. Um, we, we're working with Solar Sister on the ground who will be training um, primarily women on, entrepreneurs, but but in general uh, local communities to do the manage the manage the waste collections and the operation. So that side will be down to them. Unless you have a more detailed, um, and and also just to say that we we have our uh, our um, demonstration sites identified. One of them uh, is looking is a water cycle community, so we'll be collecting um, cassava uh, crop waste. Uh, so it's a cassava cooperative we'll, we'll be working with, but it's also by the water side. So there's a big issue with water hyacinth, and we're working with another organisation there who can use the fibre from the water hyacinth to make artisan products and and there'll be kind of a combined uh, cassava waste and water hyacinth waste collection process there uh, how Since does we're here, we also have another question here so how does a biofertilizer compare to chemical fertilizers it's it's basically has it's more rounded it's much more rounded so all the nutrients you get in your feedstock end up in the biofertilizer um, so it, it contains a lot of trace elements as well as the the, the key nutrients that you need for crop growth um, and it also has some fiber in it so it, it's actually it's better for the soil structure as well um, please could you send me your slide deck? Oh, sorry um, do you have any thoughts on moving to other West African, yes, we have. Sorry, I, I didn't manage to say in that in that quick one, but 
basically we have um, links in with other partners in uh, sorry other countries in sub-saharan africa um, uganda tanzania kenya um, Lesotho and, and, and others through through the partners we'll be working on in the project that's just started. But we also have links to in uh, direct links to Malaysia and Brazil. Um, anyone else has another question? Okay, uh, we're doing good with time. So maybe I'll just call in uh, the next entrepreneur to pitch that uh, the companies, and that is Chris Longbottom. He's from Mobile Power. So Chris, uh, take it all up. Good afternoon. Let me just share my screen. Um, is that appearing appropriately? Yes, yes, it is. Great. So, um, thanks for the introduction, Elsie. I'm Chris, CEO of, of Mobile Power, also known as Mopo. Um, so, if you haven't come across Mobile Power before, um, we are both a technology and an operating company that's present in around six countries in Sub Saharan Africa. And we are reimagining uh, how energy and transport um, can actually work from a ground up perspective. Um, and we've done that already for over 350,000 people. So, just to zoom right out and ask, well, what's the context here? Um, I think we all care about reaching net zero globally, but especially in Africa, which is probably why you're on this call. Um, and we all kind of intuitively understand that there's a great deal of sunshine in that continent um, and that solar is getting cheaper all the time. So it's kind of a bit of an awkward um, uh, fact that, you know, solar um, isn't necessarily growing as rapidly as we all would like, and that many nations are increasingly dependent upon petrol and diesel. We spent a bit of time trying to understand why that was the case. And we effectively came down to the, the, the answer that solar is just not as distributable as liquid fuels. And we're trying to change that. So what do we mean by uh, not being as distributable? We came up with three key things that we think petrol and, and diesel and other liquid fuels offer customers, uh, which aren't as easily offered by solar. Those are listed here. So versatility, portability, and a paper use model, where for any of you who've taken a motorbike taxi rider in East or West Africa will have probably experienced the rider uh, using your fare to top up with a litre of fuel. You can buy you know, a single litre of fuel, you can pay in cash, it's pretty ubiquitous and you can get it anywhere. And it's actually really hard for solar to kind of match uh, these three key features of um, liquid fuels. In order to try and achieve that, our products, um, as you can see here, we've got uh, two products presently, we've got two different uh, batteries that we call Mopo batteries. Those two batteries um, are uh, currently in use in those six nations serving 350,000 people. And we've tried to meet the uh, three criteria that I uh, previously laid out. So these are versatile batteries. You can rent a small one for just charging some phones, or you can rent a large one for um, displacing a generator or running an electric motorbike. Um, they're portable, as you can see from the photos. Um, and critically, we have a pay-per-use business model, which is fairly unique, doesn't require a deposit, there's no long-term commitment, so it mimics that fuel interaction. So how do we actually do this? How does this work? Well, we install infrastructure. Um, uh, fundamentally, that infrastructure is uh, what we call a Mopo Hub. It's a solar-powered asset um, which charges batteries and is managed by uh, local agents who we employ. Um, and those agents are uh, responsible for distributing those charged batteries to our customers who then use them for a range of different applications, whether they be phone charging, lighting, or all the way through to electric vehicles. Um, but at this point, it's just worth noting um, that there's actually a very deep technology stack behind uh, this innovation that actually enables it to work. So it's worth noting before I go on to explaining how the customer services actually work. Um, that deep technology stack goes all the way from the kind of management level of ensuring that we get batteries back and ensuring that agents and customers behave appropriately to create a stable revenue stream, all the way down to the nuts and bolts of how you actually make a secure battery pack at the kind of lowest hardware level. And we have a patent around uh, how this system works. 
So what are the services? Very briefly, we have three services. The first service is for low-income uh, customers. We've been doing this for about 10 years. It's quite a unique way to solve energy access for lower-income customers. Uh, customers rent a small power bank, which they use to um, uh, run their household, and it can do phone charging, lighting, small appliances like TVs and fans. Um, and this is a, a profitable kind of segment of the market for us that we're, we're, we're very happy with. Um, the second service is for kind of wealthier customers further up the, the, the ladder who might already be running petrol generators and spending a huge amount on fueling those generators because generators are typically very inefficient um, because they can't very easily match their uh, their uh, operating set point to the uh, to, to the electrical demand that's coming from them. Um, so I think people have probably seen the stat that Nigeria alone spends 14 billion on on fueling and running generators every year. And um, the third service is electric vehicles, both two and three wheel electric vehicles. We've been uh, running that for about 18 months, and in those uh, markets, especially in off grid markets. Um, battery swap is, is pretty key, um, and this is an enabler for those services, um, and the same battery serves both. In terms of the, the market size for this, it's very difficult to get very accurate numbers, so we decided to just look at the countries that we're actually operating in. Um, and across those four countries, the you know the kind of well-established Mobile 50 business very quickly gets you to um, 100 million a year, uh, even with only or, or 75 million a year, even with only a 5% penetration, but it's obviously a much bigger story around the others. We have a proven financial track record. You know, we've 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 um we've got an almost exponential growth rate of our, our revenue and our rentals. Um and uh, each hub at a unit economic level will pay itself off comfortably in a kind of 12 month time frame. Um we are currently uh, thinking about how we deliver the project pipeline that we have. And so we're starting to have conversations um, with folks uh, to raise additional equity at some point in the next kind of three to 12 months. Um, thank you very much. Amazing, amazing, Chris. Thank you so much for your pitch. Uh, that was really good. Uh, you also took, it, took us quite uh, brief and short, so that was really good. So I invite the audience now to ask questions to Chris. Uh, just take it away, Chris. You can just check on the chat box as well yep. and keep on answering as they come. Yeah, no worries. Which countries are the services being delivered? Um, so our, our own B2C markets are Sierra Leone, Liberia, Nigeria, and DRC, but we also have partners in uh, Uganda and Zambia. DRC is our, our newest market as well. We're very excited about the DRC market. Ah, sorry, I didn't see there's some questions further up there as well. Um, yeah, uh, life span of batteries. We do we do a lot of work on on battery uh, lifetime. Um, something that's really worth pointing out is that the um, the EV business and the generator replacement business are actually codependent on each other. So the um, the EV business can put batteries which have uh, uh, batteries which aren't providing as much energy as would be ideal in the EV application, then can later be used in the generator replacement market. But we target about a thousand cycles um, on our uh, NMC um, stuff, uh, and in Mobo Fifty, that's typically four years. Um, and then at the end of life, we have a you know, whole program around um, how we will kind of ensure we have closed loop and um, to be able to get those batteries back out. Because, of course, these are hubs that we continue to um, operate and maintain. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's good to do so. And yeah, Nick, nice, nice to see you on here. I didn't realize you were here. Uh, disposal plans again. So I guess that same question again, um, uh, but particularly on, on the end of life bit. We use um, uh, we do use batteries that have cobalt in because of the energy density, and that actually creates an opportunity on export because it means that there's a um, a, a kind of a value to the asset at end of life uh, which is not insignificant. And because of that closed loop nature, we have a, a plan in place with um, with various parties that I, I won't go too deeply into, but to export those batteries at end of life. 
Uh, so, Chris, we are done with time in terms of our Q and A Q&A session. Uh, but I can see one week. Let's take one more question from Ashdeep, and then uh, sure. we're going to go to the next. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, I'm sounding great. Uh, you know, impressed with what they're doing. Um, we are very focused on uh, the battery part of the equation. We're equally as excited about generator replacement as we are e-mobility. We see e-mobility as one of the applications for our batteries. Um, and Ampersand, obviously operating in kind of relatively grid-rich environment in terms of having a good tariff from the um, Rwandan government, et cetera. We are very focused on how we make this work in markets where there isn't um, adequate uh, grid resource. And therefore, a lot of our um, thought goes into how we make this work um, where we have to supply the generation. And that goes hand in hand with the generator piece, because, of course, you don't have the generator re replacement business if you are in a grid rich environment. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you again, Chris. Uh, on to our next enterprise, which is yeah. Africa Power Limited. Uh, Alistair Livesley, uh, you can take it ahead. Uh, can you take it down? Uh, you're on. You're on mute, Alistair. In case you're speaking, we can't hear you. <clears throat> there Thank we go. you. <laughs> uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Alistair Livesey. I'm the managing director of uh, Africa Power. Africa Power. It was founded in 2012. Uh, we design, implement, and supply. Uh, solar uh, solar power products. Um, products shown there include our solar modular solar home system, our night fishing lights. We do refrigeration. We do cell phone charging. We sell these products in three countries, in Tanzania, Uganda, and Zambia, under the QA Solar banner. Uh, the off-grid solar power market gives us the opportunity to offer healthcare products. And the biggest healthcare issue in Africa is malaria. About 630,000 people die from malaria each year. 330 million contract it, leading to morbidity and absence from work and school. 95% of malaria cases occur in sub-Saharan Africa. Malaria is an African problem. The absence from work and the healthcare costs costs Africa 12 billion in lost GDP. At an individual level, that's lost wages, that's lost school time, trapping families in poverty. Our solution is that we've developed a very low power consumption, active spatial repellent. Uh, it consists of a fan and a motor battery in there, and we have replaceable coins that go in the top, these compressed cotton coins carrying the chemical, and then it's uh, blown around the room. We've got multiple ways of uh, providing the power for this as solar solutions, but the power consumption is such that it has a negligible impact on the runtime of solar home systems, and we will be uh, providing a mosquito spider system with every solar home system sold. Progress to date, we've tested its clinical efficiency. London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and its free flight looms uh, measured a 90% bite reduction. Compare that to a 70% bite reduction that you get from topical sprays and creams, and that's before you start sweating and rubbing it off. We've delivered 150 systems to an NGO, the Children of Songea, and we're undertaking field compliance trials. We see two sets of sales channels. One is the conventional solar, uh, small-scale solar uh, distribution channels. We're selling it, we'll be selling it to our solar energy distributors and retailers in countries. But we also want to sell this direct to solar home manufacturers so that this becomes a standard product in their offering, just as people offer three lights, cell phone charging and radio, so they should be protecting their customers against malaria. A new channel to us is direct to the donor and government programs, malaria programs. And again, our partner, London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine, now spun out as um, an exploitation company, Arctech, 
will give us access to those uh, schemes and to those uh, companies. As you can see below, Africa Power is profitable and has a growing turnover, and so we can support that. What's the size of the market? The global mosquito repellent market is about 4.1 billion. If we sold a spider in every solar home system, we'd have annual sales of 1.3 million units. Malaria campaign, Zambia is quite a small country, but it spends 120 million annually on malaria reduction. If we sold them a mosquito spider with a two light solar home power, solar lighting system to power it, they would be able to provide electricity and protection from malaria to 10% of the families just using 10% of that funding. What are we looking for? We are seeking finance, uh, debt finance, to fill the distribution pipeline and the warehouse and storage in order to get this new uh, product out to market. As you can see, a 40-foot high-Q container containing about 20,000 of these units would cost us a quarter of a million pounds. So our debt financing here will cover two of the containers in the pipeline. As you can see from the bottom, there are good margins in here for everyone in, in the pipeline, from the wholesale to the retail prices, and there's a good margin for us as well at the wholesale price. We have a strong and experienced management team uh, who've worked a long time in uh, renewable energy uh, and in Africa, um, but I draw attention particularly to our partners, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, who are providing the malaria experience uh, the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine has been working on malaria for 120 years since its foundation. Funding has come from the children of Songea and Innovate UK, and I'd like to thank them for that. Any questions? Thank you, Alistair. Uh, so I'd like to invite as well the audience. Any questions for him? If I can find the chat, I'll start responding to that. Uh, Freddie, come in if you can read the questions. Hello, there. I've got nothing at the moment, but if there's anyone who's got a question on the floor, then um, please feel free to ask. Are there any um, people who from the solar home system industry out there? And if so, can I ask them the question? Uh, would you would you put this in as a product uh, into your solar home system offering? And if not, why not? Amazing question, Alistair. So yes, you can just um, add your answers to the chat box uh, we've got one here from ashdeep um what was the process to designing the product user research customer discovery etc oh, um I, I, the original start of this was a challenge for one of our directors who actually developed uh, some of the pyrethroids as his phd and recognized the absolute need uh and challenged us to be able to uh distribute uh, the system at very, very low power. Um, if you go to, if you travel abroad, you will know that in a hotel, you quite often get an oil-filled um, device which plugs into the power and everyone says it's negligible power. It's only five watts. It heats up the oil and dispenses the company. Uh, five watts over a night time will wipe out the entire solar home system uh, energy requirement of, of a storage. So the whole thing was to get very, very efficient uh, battery powered uh, fan. Um, once we once we cracked that, then it was basically going through with London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and the University of, of uh, Loughborough to get the chemical concentrations correct um, in the atmosphere in a typical room size to have the um, appropriate effect. Um, the effect on mosquitoes is threefold. Um, it repels them, it disorientates them so they don't bite, and it does have an insecticide property, so, so it kills them. 90% um, drop in biting is really quite critical because do remember that a mosquito has to bite twice 
before it infects you with malaria. For, for those that are in the any space and don't know this, a mosquito has to bite someone that has been infected. The parasite then grows in the body um, over, I can't quite know how long it is, about two to three weeks. And only after that point, when they bite someone else, will they infect someone. So if you do a simple, uh, rather oversimplified uh, physics uh, for recognition that you're only getting 10% of the bites, and then 10% of those are infectious, you're down to 99% reduction in malaria. It's a bit of an oversimplification, but it is really critical that, that it's having. Position of the device. Okay, Alistair, Alistair, we have two more questions, and then uh, we can go to the other uh, entrepreneurs. Maybe you can answer that too. Yep, absolutely. Um, does it have any possible health effects? Absolutely not at the uh, concentrations being used. It's it's uh, down at about one hundredth of the concentration, which has an impact on uh, human health. Um, uh, uh, positioning doesn't make a difference to the efficacy. Would or well if put into the corner. It'd be better if it's put in, put into. Um, it would be better that it's put in the middle of the room to disperse it, but indeed the fan helps circulate it through the room. Uh, much needed solution, do you operate under an independent power producer permit? Uh, not needed for the size of the unit. Uh, the power requirements for it are so low that uh, nearly all countries allow you to sell solar home systems uh, or the power product to directly power this uh, well below the need for independent power, power production products uh but it could be used in um an off-grid um a um a microgrid net uh we could provide a uh, an appropriate uh converter i to go mains charger um or from uh, any uh, voltage uh 12 volt 24 48 volt dc uh, converter it's basically a micro usb charging port amazing amazing thank you alistair uh so please do also send in your emails so that people can be able to reach you. Uh, and this is, goes also to Chris and Rukia. Uh, other than that, I'd like to invite our next enterprise, which is Pyrogenesis. So Simon, um, yes, please take it away. Okay, uh, I'll just uh, sh share my screen. Can you hear me okay, I'll see. And can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. I'm Simon. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Biogenesis, and we're a technology and operation company. We're seeking to commercialize our technology in Nigeria, which is uh, the world's largest mini-grid market. And um, the map that you see on the right, each of those green dots uh, represents an off-grid community. Uh, we conducted a survey with the uh, University of Leicester to assess um, their access to um, waste biomass. And we found out that 98% of them have sufficient biomass to meet their entire energy demands. And most of them have so much biomass that they could do that 20 times over, uh, which to, you know, potentially could make them net exporters of uh, biofuels, um, as well as generating all their own electricity. Um, this is quite significant because 51% of the country's population live in rural areas that are far away from the national grid. So um, that equates to 80 million people without access to power. And um, providing th uh, this market uh, with uh, power represents a $9.2 billion uh, year market opportunity. Um, for the SAM, we're focusing on cassava processors, which represent $3.6 billion a year. And for our SOM, we're focusing on um, generating income from 50 installations that will generate about $153 billion a year by converting what these communities have an abundance of, which is waste biomass, and giving them something they have they don't tend to have, which is access to electricity, but also helping them to convert that to um, commodities. And so really what we do is we use our technology to enable agri-processors and rural communities uh, to convert these underutilized wastes into renewable energy, biofuels, biofertilizer, and carbon removal. So we integrate our patented pyrolysis technology, which we call pyrochemy, with other technologies and processes to develop circular economy solutions and systems. So pyrolysis, which is what our technology is based on, is an advanced thermochemical conversion technology, very powerful. And alchemy, a process that converts base materials to high value commodities, hence why we've called our technology pyrochemy. Our business model is based on one, 
B2B Energy as a Service via 10-year PPAs for renewable electricity, heat and cooling. Two, offtake contracts for biofuels, Nutrichar, which is a biofertilizer that we've trademarked, and carbon credits. And three, Pyrogenesis builds, owns, and operates each pyrochem installation. Today, we're asking for 1.3 million in equity to achieve 153 million turnover within the next five years. We're going to invest that in a 36 month runway that will see us uh, launching a UK demonstrator at an industri uh, industrial customer site. And we need to ship our pyrochemy pilot unit from Italy to the UK. We need to recruit and train local plant operators. We need to retain our existing UK engineering staff. And then we're going to install, commission, and operate the pilot unit at that um, customer site. We need to pay for patent registration costs because our technology is patented now, and that's in multiple ter territories. And then we have two um, demonstrators, one for biofuel and another for bioenergy, uh, both of them working in partnership with cassava processors. Now, our, our, the, our techno-economic uh, analysis estimates an ROI of 35% best case, uh, worst case 11%. So Pyrochemy uses um, for its feedstock, harvest and agri-processor wastes that don't compete with land use for food production. That's really important. Um, we put that into the machine, which, uh, as I said, is based on pyrolysis, and pyrolysis will always produce quite a lot of biochar, about one third of what we put in. And that biochar, we upgrade to a biofertilizer, which we've trademarked as Nutrichar. And Nutrichar, when applied to soils, is eligible for carbon removal credits. So that's one of our income sources, as well as selling the Nutrichar. Uh, you can also use biochar as a smoker's fuel, and then when used in clean cooking stoves, that can also um, qualify for carbon credits as well. For energy access, of course, we generate electricity, uh, process heat, especially for the agri-processors, and cooling, which is very much needed, especially in you know, various parts of um, Africa uh, for reducing post-harvest losses. Uh, alternatively, we can produce bio-oil, and we've developed with our partners, Aston University, a method for upgrading this bio-oil to renewable ke kerosene, which is again used for cooking rather than firewood, and also renewable diesel, which can be used in agricultural equipment and gensets. So Pyrogenesis is led by a team of bioenergy experts who happen to be entrepreneurs. Um, I focus on business development and investor engagement. My co-founder, Dr. Eki, uh, he's responsible for feedstock and product quality control. Dr. Sagir's specialism is in plant design and operation and environmental health and safety. And Malcolm focuses on financial modeling and developing management systems for the organization. So brief view of our financials. Um, as I said, our SOM is focusing on cassava processors and they would provide enough feedstock to fuel over 2,000 pyrochemy installations that would generate about 550 megawatts of electricity and remove 11 million tonnes of CO2 per year. And that's removal, not offsetting, actually removes it from the environment. So this um, untapped SAM is worth, as I said earlier, $3.6 billion. And by 2027, with 50 commercial units, our SOM should be worth $153 million a year. Uh, in this uh, PPA example here, what you'll see is that our pyrochemy um, technology uh, generates power that competes effectively against the 1,000 kVA diesel genset, which is typically used by agri-processors, whilst producing an annual income of above a million dollars. And, um, you know, this is based on, you know, them having electricity for only eight hours a day. Now... Another aspect that we focus on very strongly to make sure that we've got a viable business case is that we use geospatial mapping to evaluate the location of each pyrochemy installation. And that ensures that we have uh, everything that we need uh, for commercial viability at that location. So here is a community that was off grid that um, we surveyed. This is one of the uh, green dots that you saw on the map uh, from uh, the REA database. And uh, we found that the REA data correlated with our survey findings in terms of population, energy use, and affordability. So these are all key to the success um, you know, factors for our business model. In addition, uh, biomass availability is key to the success of our technology because that's what we use as our feedstock. And we use satellite data to assess um, the following criteria, land area under cultivation. Uh, you can see the image on the right. Uh, also indicates, um, first of all, where the biomass is available 
And then when it's available with the harvest date detection, that's that little legend you can see month by month, we can tell what's been harvested, where it is, and then its proximity to our processing facility. Um, and then, of course, we also evaluate the transportation routes uh, to get there. Uh, so um, this it all helps us to build up um, a business case for each location, um, wherever it may be on the planet. That's uh, what I have to tell you today. I hope this is something that's going to be of interest to you. And if it is, uh, by all means, please uh, fire away with your questions and also do get in touch. Uh, we are registered in the UK, but we also have uh, an operating base in Ibadan in Nigeria. And so these are my contact details uh, via WhatsApp uh, in the UK and also in Nigeria. Thank you very much. Thanks again, Simon. So we do have one question from George. Um, is there a plan to build a smaller modular solution that can be deployed into fields or by farmers with smaller size farms? Um, the smallest unit that we are looking to build, George, is going to be 100 kilowatts, which would convert about six tons of biomass per day, requiring about 2,000 tons a year. Um, it's just because of the you know, unit economics why that would be the smallest system. Um, you know, so uh, if you've got sufficient biomass and sufficient demand, uh, when we're doing the techno-economics, we can see whether that demand is in terms of generating electricity or exporting commodities such as the kerosene that I mentioned, um, or whether there's a big enough market for the um, agri, uh, the biofertilizer in that proximity, in that locality. So those are the kind of things that we balance up when we look at the techno-economics of each installation site. So there has to be sufficient demand for the different products and services that we can provide, and there has to be sufficient availability of biomass. Thank you very much for that question. Thank you. We also have another question from Douglas. Uh, which other biomass can be used? This is a question from East Africa. Um, anything that burns, Dorcas. Uh, we can even include plastic, but the problem with plastic is that we wouldn't be able to then use the biochar um, for, as a biofertilizer because it's contaminated. Uh, but that can be part of a waste management um, facility. And then the, the char, we wouldn't call it biochar, we'd call it char, uh, can then um, be used in construction materials. So that's another destination that also earns carbon credits as well. So as I said, you know, it's also te um, the technology is a carbon removal technology because of it, the fact that it fixes carbon and then removes that carbon from the environment, which it won't return to the environment for at least 100 years, if not up to 1,000 or more. Amazing, amazing. Um, not seeing any other question for now. So if you do have any other questions, please, you can have them on the chat box. And also, Simon, please share your contacts so I can also be able to reach you and, you know, see your pitch deck and just understand it more from their perspective. Um, okay. So we'll go to our next enterprise, which is uh, Innovations. So we'll have Craig uh, take it away. Okay. Thank you, Elsie. And let me just get this screen up. This is a complementary technology to what you've just seen from Simon at Pyrogenesis. How would you like to invest in a market that's worth 50 billion pounds a year with potential greenhouse gas savings of 800 million tons of CO2 equivalent every year? In other words, double the UK's annual emissions. Sorry, Craig, we can't see your slides. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Craig. Yeah, we, yeah, okay. I think they, they Let came me just up try again. again. Yeah, please. Uh -huh. Thank you. Slight technical hitch. Try again. Can you see that now? Yeah, it's coming up. Okay, good. All right, there we go. Try again. How would you like to invest in a, a market that's worth 50 billion pounds a year with potential greenhouse gas savings of 800 million tons a year of CO2 equivalent? In other words, roughly double the UK's annual emissions. I'm Craig Jameson, founder and director of Straw Innovations. And the problem that we're addressing is rice straw, the stems and leaves that are left in the field after harvesting the world's number one food crop. There's about 750 million tons of this straw 
produced every year in Asia. But instead of being a resource that's useful, it's wasted. Why? Because it's stranded in often flooded rice paddy fields. This leaves farmers with only two main options. Number one is to plow it in, as you would normally, but in flooded rice fields. That's a problem for farmers. It creates many agronomical problems, which they don't like. So they don't do that very willingly. The second option is for them to burn it. It's an option, but it's banned right across Asia. Unfortunately, it still continues because of a lack of other choices that farmers have at harvest time, with deleterious effects on farmer health, rural communities, and the environment. Straw Innovations is coming in with a new third option for farmers, which is to remove it. They like that because it leaves a nice clean field for them. And we can remove at the same time as harvesting the rice, and we can sell or use that straw for clean energy. But how do you say, you say, how do we, how do we get that out of flooded fields? If like in the photo, it's difficult even to get machinery into that, never mind the straw out of that. As soon as that straw touches the field, or the the pond in this case, it would be ruined on contact. So our solution is a rather clever suite of technologies that removes that without touching the field. And we have been developing that over the last five years since the company was started. And you can see the effects here on the right. On the left is a normal field that has been harvested with the standard, what they call full feed combine harvesters that leave a very high stubble and lots of trash on top. And on the right, our five centimeter roughly stubble that is We've removed the straw and now they can just, the farmers can plow that in easily and get started on their next crop, which is critical. And we are not selling our technology per se, but we're packaging it, bundling it as a better harvesting service. The benefits for the farmer are that they get 10% more crop if they've got shatter resistant modern hybrids. Um, we, our harvesters harvest the grain much more cleanly and drop less of it in the field. We can also remove the straw, which as I said, enables the farmers to get started on their next crop much faster. And this works even in flooded fields, which we believe is a world first. It's backed up by a patent that's pending and more planned in the future, 10 years research and development, and a specialist team of engineers who are able to maintain and adapt our technologies. <coughs> Excuse me. And we have partnerships in our supply chain up and down with leading players in their fields, making this difficult to replicate. Our value proposition specifically for the farmers is that we halve the costs of harvesting for the farmer. Our service is the same cost, but we're avoiding the additional grain losses that they suffer with the normal harvesters and the additional land preparation that they have to make because of all the straw that's left in their fields. So we're halving the costs of harvesting for the farmers. Uh, and that's borne out by testimonials from our early adopter farmers who are saying they're delighted with it and would recommend it to other farmers. The climate impact is massive with this because rice is a major emitter. And just by removing the straw before we've even done anything with it, we're halving the emissions from the rice production. If we then use that for clean energy, for bioenergy, we're in effect reducing the emissions by 75%. And rice, for those of you who are not aware of this, it's accountable for half the global emissions from crop production. Can you believe that? One crop is accountable for half all the crop emissions globally. And that red bar at the top is from methane. And we halve that by removing the straw from the flooded rice fields. As a result of these benefits, many climate benefits, Straw Innovations has been elected by investors onto this year's diamond list of the top 60 startups globally helping to fight climate change. And 
our business model is initially just not to take the straw harvesting out, but to start off leading with the rice harvesting service. We have the machines up and running that can do that. And then in year two, add on the machines that come behind that to collect and remove and sell the straw or use it for bioenergy. The total addressable market in the Philippines is around 1.5 billion pounds every year, potentially. And that's from the rice and the straw co-harvesting. The Philippines is itself only just 3% of Asia's total market. We have a beachhead within the Philippines, which is with SL Agritech Corporation, which is the largest rice company in the Philippines, who've seen our technology. They really like it, and they are wanting us to harvest for their 5,000 hectares of contract farmers just in one area north of Manila, which would give us a turnover of £6 million per year there. One of their senior managers has really sung the praise of our technology and is encouraging its adoption in that number one rice harvesting region of the Philippines. Okay, one so minute, we, one minute. Sure. We are aiming to get to that 5,000 hectares in year two and then become cash positive in year three. And by year five, reach 40,000 hectares and 48 million pound turnover, which would only be less than half of SL Agritech's contract farmers, to put that in perspective. And we have a return on investment of one year, just one year on our harvesting technologies. Um, so we are looking, we're starting a 1.6 million pound three-year project to commercialize. And we are looking for a loan of 200,000 pounds towards the capital costs of new machines to help us to get into that market. We have a very talented team of engineers and business development managers and bioenergy specialists who are the ones who make that happen. And I would love to hear from you if you're interested in investing. Please note my email and I'll take any questions. I hope you'll join us and help transform Asia's largest waste into a surprising climate solution. Amazing. Thank you, Craig. Uh, I'd like to invite now the audience. Is there any question for Craig as of now? We have a question from Simon. How is the straw collected? <laughs> Simon, yes, we are. We've developed a suite of technologies that enable us to collect the straw behind the combine harvesters. Um, and it's a different kind of combine harvester. The normal ones cut it very high because they're just trying to get the grain out of the field and that's all they want. Um, they are very inefficient if they're cutting low, uh, which is why normally you'd have to have a tractor and a chopper and a rake and a baling machine and uh, another straw collector, um, five operations to get the straw out of the field. With ours, two machines, one pass in the field. And that's where we have a patent pending on our, on our technology. Um, maybe one final question. Is there a minimum acreage recommended for a harvest run? No. No, there's no minimum um, acreage or hectareage, but uh, we are uh, operating in areas that have significant rice production. And so per field doesn't matter so much as long as there is the aggregate demand for, for our harvesting services. Um, to make it slightly easier, we are um, harvesting tends to be uh, initially the, the larger fields, some are 100 hectares plus, but we, you know, we aim to uh, be able to harvest any fields of farms of all different sizes. In fact, we've just been uh, doing demonstration um, harvesting in Nuevo Ecija to the north of Manila this week uh, with some that are just a few hectares, uh, one hectare in one case, so that people can see the benefits of our system. Amazing, amazing. Thank you, Craig. Um, this last question, uh, Vivi, 
Okay, it's not a question, that's fine. So I'd like to give hand it over to our last enterprise for the day, and that is Stima Co Limited. Uh, Tom Parkinson is the one who's going to be pitching for this company. So Tom, you can take it away. Thanks, Elsie. Can you sh enable sharing, please? Yes. Yeah, Tom, you should be able to share your screen now. Right, can we see that? Yeah, yeah, we can see. Yeah, visible. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. It's a pleasure to, to be here. And thanks to the Sankal team for hosting. Uh, my name is Tom Parkinson, and I'm the MD at Steamaco. We're a UK-based tech company focused on enabling merc uh, emerging market energy. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the problem we're solving, how we're doing it, and why we are the best place to solve it. So our vision is that everybody should have access to reliable and affordable power, and that should be delivered in the cleanest way possible. And we're doing this by helping utilities get paid for the power that they sell. So a little lesson for anybody who isn't aware, uh, very, very simple, but utilities make money by selling energy for more than the costs of providing it. But in Africa, the utility markets are broken. So only two national utilities make money. And one of those is the Seychelles. So it puts that into context. And this is because utilities don't collect enough cash. They lose money from technical losses on the lines, are exposed to theft through illegal connections, and meter bypass, and they bill, but don't collect enough cash. So this means in Nigeria, over 52% of electricity is not paid for. So utilities lose a combined $1.5 billion annually. And Nigerians only get an average of 6.8 hours of power a day from the grid. So it's not a great state of affairs. But this also creates a dirty footprint. Because power is both so necessary, yet so unreliable, as Mobile Power has pointed out, the country turns to small generators. And these are abundant, expensive, and polluting. Yet the entire country relies on them. If you've ever had the pleasure of going to a big city in Nigeria, you'll know that the air is thick with the smell of this generator fuel. And these generators spew out an estimated 10 million tons of CO2 per year. But they're also three times more polluting than a typical power plant, which is why if we can reduce the reliance on generators and transition to the grid, we can save people money and reduce emissions. But these generators persist because the market is broken. So how do we fix the market? Well, fundamentally, one of the issues is that utilities can't tell who is using what, exposing them to theft. Simico solves this problem by collecting, aggregating, and enabling the usage and payment data so utilities can see who is using what enabling them to detect theft and ultimately collect cash. So on the grids using Steamaco, our losses are typically less than 10%, meaning utilities can generate much more revenue and flipping them from loss making to viable. We then get paid as a result of these savings. And for us, this is a $100 million opportunity in Nigeria and a billion dollars across Africa. So we've got the market leading solution because we've focused on three things that matter. Firstly, interoperability. Our solution integrates with more data collection sources. Secondly, we enable prepaid smart metering in ways that make it easier for the consumers to pay. So we're integrating with POS systems, with mobile money, with STS, things that the typical consumer is very much used to and our leapfrog technologies. And finally, we then take this information and put it through our AI uh, models, which are proprietary, to detect theft. And then we develop a suite of apps, which then enable them to the teams to go out and resolve theft. And so to do this, we packaged up a software solution, which is sold as a, as a SaaS solution with these apps alongside. And we can also sell our uh, meters alongside this, but our software is agnostic to meter type. And because we have a flexible solution, which is focused on the, the, the right things to solve theft, our customers love us. Our team is 
comprised of some seasoned professionals, supportive investors and experienced advisors who've successfully exited from smart metering and IoT companies in the past. And we've got a network of local partners in Nigeria who open our doors and boost our sales uh, channels. And as a result of this, we've got some really promising traction, already recording contracted ARR of $1.5 million per year. We're selling to 30 customers across 16 countries. And to date, we've helped displace over 4,000 tonnes of CO2. So let me tell you a bit more about our plan. To date, we've sold to market leading solar IPPs across Africa because we enable their business model too. And this has generated about uh, nearly a million dollars of, of contracted ARR so far. And we know where the, the grid is, where the real problem is, and therefore where the real opportunity is. So we've now accelerated our journey to capture this grid market. And we focused on Nigeria as this has the optimal environment. Our first major sale was to the Energizing Education Programme, where our system is to be used across 44 universities and teaching hospitals in the country. And then the next step is to secure contracts with grid utilities. And so far, we've won seven pilots with major utilities and have bid alongside our partners in country for 1.7 million metres as part of the national smart metering rollout. And these have the potential to generate over $30 million of ARR in the next couple of years alone. But to successfully convert these pilots, we need to raise some money. And we're raising two and a half million pounds, which will help see through these pilots over the next 15 months and convert these to scalable opportunities. And these parts are already underway. We're just having to fund the, the, the remainder. We have 1 million of commitments already from existing shareholders as a lead. So we're looking for 1.5 million pounds more to follow. We'll then raise more money to scale the operations in, in the next 18 months um, to sort of um, exploit the commercial opportunities that are there. So in doing so, we'll capture about 6 million endpoints by 2026, which is only about 3% of the projected market and represents about $50 million of ARR. Um, we'll be at early stages, we're on our way there. We've already generated a million dollars this year so far, and we're growing 100% year on year. So all it leaves me to say is thank you very much for your time. Um, if you are of interest, please do feel free to reach out. I'll put my contact details in the, um, in the chat box, but I open the floor to, to any questions. Thank you very much. Amazing, amazing. Tom, actually, we have our first question. So how, how do you engage with state-owned utilities who are bound by regulatory laws and may not be open to new technologies? Thanks, George. It's a great question. So the, the technologies that we use and interface with are, um, are all compliant from in terms of the, the two regulators in Nigeria, which are the Nigerian Electrification, Electrical Regulatory Committee, NERC, and NEMSA, which is the metering standards body. And our our software sits on top of those. So there is a drive for smart metering in the country, the 6 million meters being, being included as part of the National Mass Metering Programme. And those meters will require a data layer to make the most of the information that's coming through. So they need meters, they need a data layer. At the moment, there's lots of, lots of competition for the metering, but there isn't competition at the software level. And we have 10 years experience in this market. So we are going in at that level. We take the feeds from these meters and we provide the information which enables um, the discos to operate better, but also collect more cash. So there's not really a, uh, an issue for our, for our technology with, uh, with regulatory laws in this space. However, what, it, what we have seen in the market is that a lot of the discos are trying to build it themselves. So they're trying to, to take the feeds from the multiple levels and uh, multiple different meter providers they've got and have teams internally that are trying to, to build this. But having gone in there now and, and pitched to the, to the owners and the, and the boards, they can see the value in the solution. And that's why we've, we've managed to capture actually now seven out of the 11 Nigerian discos for piloting. Okay, we have one more question from Nick. Um, when do you hope to close the current funding round? And are you looking for an external lead or have the existing investors set the price? So we hope to close the round in the next probably four, six months. Um, we're, we're happy to, to, to sort of keep the round um, open to, to, to investors that may bring um, some strategic value to us. Um, uh, given given lead times to to to, to do the investment, um, in terms of um, external lead, we'd be happy to for a for a, for another party to to come in and lead if they were willing to take a, a sizable ticket, um, and then happy for them to set the price. Thank you, thank you. Um, any let's have room for one more question, and then I'll pass it on to George. 
Yeah, I was, yeah, thank you. Thank you, LC. <clears throat> I was, I was going to just ask, uh, Tom, if, if you could do one thing to turn this company into a, a billion dollar or dollar or billion pound venture, what would it be? So f- for me, I think the, um, the key thing that we need to, to do in this market is enable franchising. So the, the grid will need power from, sorry, obviously it's trying to build power from the top from centralized routes, but we know that's taking a lot of time and we won't want to catalyze the, the major investments that are coming into the market from people like GAP, um, Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet, that are looking to bring mini grids into the space. Now we've got a lot of experience in mini grids, but we see a real um, connection between uh, sort of embedded generation, so interconnected mini grids. So to get this to a billion dollar opportunity, what we'd see is is proving out that our our, our technology works, and we see what we're doing with the pilots across those the franchising arrangements to then um, push forward the ability for the um, solar to be part of the the grid as opposed to standalone mini grids as they are mostly at the moment. So for me, that would fit flick us to a billion dollar company pretty pretty quickly. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, and thank you very much to the rest of uh, the participants uh, and the presenters. We will have the company pitch decks available and summary sheets as well. So if you're interested in taking the conversation further, I have put in my email ID in the chat box. If you'd like to reach any of these companies, please do write to me. I will make a direct introduction and we can share some documents that will enable you. Nick, it sounds like you're interested. So please, uh, let's take the conversation forward. Uh, Thank you so much for staying with us uh, 13 minutes beyond time. We hope you enjoyed this session and we hope you enjoyed uh, listening to these companies and the amazing work that they're doing in in the clean energy space. I'd now like to end the session. If you would all maybe just want to turn your cameras on and maybe wave. I think uh, that will be awesome. And then I'll just go ahead and end the session. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Have a very good rest of the day. Bye.